everyone, and thank you for being here. This is the last session of the Aquafix 2020 Wastewater Webinar Series. I'll be your presenter today, John Deneen. I'm a technical service manager at Aquafix, and today's topic will be foaming filament control. And first, we'll do just a quick bit of background about Aquafix and who we are. We are a wastewater research lab. We're located in the University of Wisconsin Research Park. And we take in samples on a daily basis from wastewater operators all around the country. You can see in these pictures some of our microbiologists and chemists. And what they're doing is helping operators to solve some of the most difficult challenges that they face. They also take the information that we learn in the lab from studying wastewater samples and apply it towards developing products that are useful to wastewater operators. We're known for our bacterial products, our biocatalysts, as well as our probiotic formulations. Today we're going to cover uh, four main topics. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of field ID and microscopic ID of the two most common foaming filaments. That'll be maybe about 10 minutes worth of information and we'll just kind of go over the key points there. Uh, next, we will talk about why foaming filaments show up, and we will go over what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then we'll move into the pros and cons of various control strategies, and we'll finish with a discussion of the way Aquafix likes to tackle these filaments, and that's with an emphasis on building the uh, health of the overall biology and gearing that towards outcompeting the filaments. So whenever we get a call from someone uh, or we're on site with a customer who has a foaming wastewater system, always start by looking at uh, four characteristics and that's gonna help us to identify the culprit of the foam. A lot of times we're thinking foaming filaments for certain foams, but we don't wanna misidentify the cause of a foam and go the wrong direction in a treatment approach. So the four things that I like to look at or if I'm working remote with a customer, have them describe to me or maybe even send in a picture, is the density of the foam, the color of the foam, how thick it is, and how long this has been going on. I have two pictures here of foams that are kind of opposite ends of the extremes in a lot of these. And the foam on the right is typical of what you would see with uh, most filamentous foams, uh, foams that are caused by either microthrix or nicardia. You could also end up with a foam that looks pretty similar to the one on the right if your plant gets a big slug of grease coming in. And that may or may not also be tied in with a filament outbreak. On the left, we have a foam that I would say is more characteristic of the foam you would get if you have a quick growth of new bacteria. There's some biosurfactants that are created when bacteria are growing quickly or chemical surfactants um, and Let's talk about the characteristics of each of these. So the one on the left is actually a wastewater process for a place that does wine production. And in this case, what happened is their lagoon had a lot of simple sugars in it and they installed a new aerator. And that new aerator plus the simple sugars allowed the bacterial population to grow really quickly. And so this is a new bacterial foam. It's fluffy on the density scale. This is something where if you sprayed it with a garden hose, it would knock back really quickly. Uh, fluffy foams do tend to come back relatively quick if there's a lot of agitation going on, but they collapse pretty easily. The color of it is really light. A lot of times for new bacteria foams, you'll see this light color, pretty typical of what you're looking at on the screen now. Uh, surfactant foams tend to be almost pure white, although surfactant foams can be uh, tannish in color similar to what you're seeing here as well. Usually these types of foams will be anywhere from one to three feet thick. Uh, the duration, so I always want to know how long something like this has been going on and how quickly the onset was. So a uh, foam like this, typically the onset is very abrupt and usually the duration is not going to be more than a week or two, whether it's surfactants or new bacterial growth. Other end of the scale, uh, this filamentous foam is very dense. It uh, is not easy to collapse and it's got a lot of structural integrity to it. The color, 
fairly dark to tan is typical for most filamentous foams. Thickness, uh, one foot is high as six feet thick uh, we have seen, although you could be early on in a filamentous foam outbreak and be just an inch or two thick. Duration, uh, a lot of times these foaming events will go on for extended periods of time. Uh, a couple weeks to, in a lot of cases, there are plants that will have uh, filamentous foam that starts in the fall and will be with their plant all the way until the spring or beyond. Uh, you know, we've worked with plants that have had a Nicardia foam that's been there for a year or more. And we're going to be focusing a lot of this presentation on getting rid of two common problem causing foaming filaments but should also take time to mention that not all filamentous bacteria are bad. Uh, they do provide some support and structure for the flock particles. Uh, it's at higher levels of filamentous bacteria that you start getting sludge bulking, and in the case of this presentation, foaming issues. Um, so just know that some, filament, some amount of filaments can actually be a good thing. And the foaming filaments we're talking about today, Microthrix and Nicardia, the way they actually cause foam is by trapping air and mixed liquor, and then it rises up to the surface, and at the surface of the water, when it becomes agitated, it causes foam. So here we're going to pivot into a little bit of micro analysis. We're not going to get super deep into it, but cover the high points so everyone has seen at least what these filaments look like and have kind of an idea of what they should be looking for on their end if they have a microscope in their lab, or even this can be helpful for interpreting a report that's done, done by others. Um, one thing that's important for filament ID is staining the samples. And so the staining is something that just brings out the color in the filament, it makes it a lot easier to see, but it's actually also an important part of identifying certain filaments. So the way that a filament accepts the stain uh, is part of the ID process. So what you're looking at on the upper right here is a slide that has been stained and you see that purple color and that's uh, the gram stain. Uh, you can get the staining kits uh, relatively inexpensively. I think uh, the one I'm showing here is just on like USA Blue Book and it's $100 and it'll last you forever practically. Uh, it contains crystal violet iodine uh, decolorizer and a counter stain. It's a process that involves several steps to actually have it come out and may take just a little bit of practice and definitely takes a little bit of time, but something that if you're doing microanalysis anyway and you have any interest in understanding the filament population, this makes that a lot easier. So you can find pretty simple procedures online and uh, wanted to mention that because next we'll go through the microscopic slides of those two starting with nicardia and so here uh, lab id the key thing to note on this slide is a true branching structure so if you follow any one of these strands of filaments you see a spot uh, where it branches off in two other directions that branching structure is somewhat unique to nicardia and it's definitely a tell telltale sign uh, you can see this one has been stained and it's gram staining positive, which means it took the purple color and it, it pops like it does here, uh, just visually. Uh, as far as field ID goes for this filament, uh, this is the most dense and the most stable foam. This filament is going to be tan to brown in color. It's going to be very resistant to collapsing and it's going to be up to several feet thick. This is the one that we see get up to like six feet in say like an aerobic digester with tall walls. This, this foam can really build up high. And then one other note, it uh, actually provides really good uptake of BOD. And we'll talk in a little bit about the reasons for that and why it's important. At first glance, that probably seems like a good thing, but it's really uh, Nicardi is a net negative to have around, but there is that one, one feature of it that's notable. Here is an image of a wastewater plant that is in the early stages of having a Nicardia outbreak. Uh, so this plant's actually doing really well. They're just starting to get some young Nicardia. You can see a little bit of foam building up around the edges of the basin there. And uh, 
I've just zoomed in on a certain spot here. I think what we're really seeing here in the zoomed in spot is probably just a little bit of that healthy natural foam that, that you want every wastewater plant to have, combining with you're starting to see some of the spots where it's getting a little denser and thicker. And that's just reflecting the structural integrity that the Nicardia is starting to add to that natural fluffy foam that you like. Here is Nicardia in a system that's a lot more advanced. This is one of those plants that had Nicardia for going on a year, I would say, uh, at the point where this picture was taken. And so you can see it's 100% coverage across the basin. Uh, in this case, only a couple inches thick. And if you look at the top center of the screen, you can see they're spraying the foam down with a garden hose, trying to collapse it. And with some foams that works, with Nicardia, it tends not to work very well at all. You can see they're having uh, minimal success at collapsing this foam. And that's just real typical of Nicardia foam. So the other one then is Microthrix. This is the, the other of the two big foam causers. And you can see again, purple color, it's taken that gram stain. Uh, it's really popping off the screen because of that. And so it's gram positive staining. It doesn't have any branching like the Nicardia. Uh, the way we tend to describe this one is like a tangled mat of spaghetti. Um, when you get a lot of microthrix, tends to just look like a plate of spaghetti. Our microbiologists note, if you are doing microscopic observations, and you don't have the staining technique down or the equipment to do it, it don't trust an observation of microthrix uh, without the stain. And reason for that is that there are other filaments that can actually look really similar to microthrix, but would have totally different causes and then totally different ways that you would try to resolve that issue. Um, so with Nicardia, you can sometimes ID it without the staining. Microthrix, we're much more hesitant to uh, trust an observation of Microthrix without the stain as a, a positive ID. And here we have a field shot of some Microthrix that's growing in a plant. Um, you can see, again, it's pretty dense, it's pretty stable. Uh, this plant, maybe 50% surface coverage. And on the, uh, on the edges, this one's getting to three or four inches thick. There was a, a point in time where I'd always described Microthrix as having a little bit darker foam and Nicardia is a more of a tanner foam. And since then, I've kind of learned uh, or come to the understanding that the color of the foam you see on the surface tends to actually be more reflective of the color of your sludge. So this one's got a very chocolatey brown uh, mixed liquor to it. And like we had discussed, the filaments trap that mixed liquor and bring it to the surface. And so I think the, the chocolatey color here is more reflective of the color of the mixed liquor. Uh, if you look, look back on the Nicardia slide earlier, I think that's probably just a lighter colored mixed liquor. Here's an oxidation ditch that is also uh, dealing with some microthrix. In an oxidation ditch like this, there's a lot less agitation overall. So this plant maybe had 30% coverage, if that, of the foam, but they actually had a pretty sizable outbreak of microthrix going on. You see the foam show up after the aerators, um, but the, this one was to the point where it was impacting settling. So even though it wasn't 100% coverage, at first glance may not uh, look like it's causing much problem. Uh, in an oxidation ditch like this, uh, that was actually uh, a fairly bad outbreak of microthrix. And we won't show you a uh, microscopic slide for surfactant-based foam because there's generally not a lot to see. Surfactants may disperse the flock a little bit, um, but as far as actually seeing surfactant, there's, there's not much you can see. But it does tend to be pretty obvious uh, visually. So uh, surfactants can end up in your plant if you're an industrial plant. Uh, they're used in a lot of cleaning products. Uh, so they can end up in your plant that way. Municipal plants, uh, there are industries in most of your towns that use soap-based cleaning products. And if some of them go down the drain accidentally or, or even intentionally, a big slug of it can make a white foam like this. And so this is just an example of some surfactant-based foam. And we'll talk about how Aquafix deals with this as well as the filament foams. Uh, whenever you're doing micro on a foam, 
we always recommend that you grab a sample of the mixed liquor and also a sample of the foam itself. Prepare a slide of each. Uh, the reason for the foam sample is it shows you uh, the filaments tend to concentrate there. And so the foam sample will show you the greatest concentration. The mixed liquor sample will show you how much of it is currently growing in the mixed liquor. <clears throat> Our lab generally is doing these shots at 1000X magnification. Uh, we'll look at what the difference between 1000 and 100 is here in a second. Uh, Nicardia, a lot of times you can tell uh, that it's Nicardia with less magnification. So here's that example. Um, this is a 100X, uh, magnification of, well, a foam sample. And you can see the unstained one on the left, that branching structure, it starts to be pretty apparent at 100X, even without the stain, that this is Nicardia because of the branching. Just to show you what going to 1000 does, and once you add the stain, you get a lot clearer picture. <clears throat> And I'd mentioned uh, to grab a sample of mixed liquor and foam, and here's an example of why that's important. The, the case study here, this is a, a customer who had been doing some treatment for about 30 days, and we had a baseline microanalysis where there was quite a bit of Nicardia in their mixed liquor, and there were excessive amounts of Nicardia in the foam. Now, after about 30 days, we did a follow-up microanalysis with this customer, and what you're seeing on the left here is the mixed liquor at that time. And so this is 100X and it's phase contrast, which is a, a microscope setting that kind of makes the flock show off a little better here. So that's where that bright color is coming from. But you can see in the mixed liquor, they had relatively small amounts of Nicardi at that point and some little spirochetes floating around in the bulk liquid there, but not a whole lot of uh, Nicardia. Now they noted that they did still have some foam in their basin. It seemed to be lessening, but was still a significant amount at this point at 30 days. So the image on the right here is the slide of the foam, and you can see they still had excessive amounts of Nicardia. So what that tells us is that the plant was moving in the right direction. It doesn't appear to be growing any significant amounts of new Nicardia in the mixed liquor. Nicardia in the foam at the surface can be somewhat persistent and sticking around, but in a case like this, we would feel pretty confident that if that foam level or foam layer were removed, that they would go back to normal pretty quickly because there doesn't seem to be a lot of Nicardia in the mixed liquor here. Uh, quickly, uh, something to always keep in mind when doing a microscopic analysis, if you're looking at filaments, is to always be looking at it with one goal in mind to be to get an idea of what your relative sludge age is. This chart is something we plot in every microscopic analysis we do. And on the far right end, where you start getting to older sludge, that's where you start seeing a lot of these filaments pop up. So pay attention to the higher life forms and other indicator organisms and what that means in terms of sludge age. Uh, you know, it's handy to have a reference chart on hand if you're doing microscopic. Um, but when you get to the older sludge age, that's when you start seeing a lot of the, the problem foaming filaments come up. Some of you may not have a good microscope or the staff maybe already has a lot on their plate uh, and you know you're just not gonna get to a weekly or, or a daily microscopic analysis. Maybe you don't have someone trained in the staining techniques. Uh, if your plant's running pretty well, uh, maybe you would benefit just from a periodic like quarterly or even once or twice a year microscopic analysis, but you don't wanna invest in a lot of infrastructure to make that happen. Um, we do offer uh, filament testing. We have the filament origins test and you send us a sample. Our microbiologists uh, ID all filaments that are there, name the causes and recommended solutions. They plot you on that sludge age graph that I had, rec or had shown. They give a description of the flock structure and oxygen penetration into the flock. Also the amount and type of EPS that's present. Um, and also look at the high, higher life forms and go over any other concerns you might have. That's $425. The turnaround time is four days. So from the time we get the sample, you get a report back pretty quickly. I'll show you what the report looks like in a second. 
Um, but yeah, we send you a cooler and sample bottles, two bottles labeled for mixed liquor, two bottles labeled for foam. You just fill that foam sample up halfway. Uh, we want to keep some oxygen in there, a uh, little bit of head space so the bacteria can breathe in transit, and then grab us some foam and send it back to us. And four business days later, you get a report and we show you exactly what we saw under the slides. Uh, name the types of filaments, their abundance and their causes. And then, uh, you know, this is just a couple pages I'm showing right here, but also talk about what we recommend in terms of getting the plant back where you want it if there are problems identified. So this is going to be a quick pause for questions. That's all the talk about microscopic analysis. If that's a topic you want to learn more about, check out one of the other uh, Aquafix webinar series. Michael from our lab did a great presentation where he covered a lot in a lot more detail and covered more topics related to microanalysis. Um, so I'm pausing for questions. A uh, question about what if foam is only present in the anoxic basins? That would sound less common to me, but probably I would say you're getting uh, some some filaments recycled back to that part of the plant. Uh, that's one where you would really want to have a microscopic evaluation uh, in-house or uh, sent out and see exactly what's causing the foam in that spot. Uh, someone here says that they know they have microthrix and it's positive on the India ink. Um, would these two be related? Oh yeah, I would say uh, definitely if that's, uh, you know you have microthrix and it's in foaming in the anoxic. Microthrix isn't really likely to grow in the anoxic basin, but it's probably getting returned there and finding conditions where there's more biosurfactants potentially. Um, but yeah, I would say almost definitely related. Uh, shoot us an email and we can talk over that one. Uh, someone here says uh, they've mechanically removed foam and increased wasting and that's helping. Why is this? And that's something we're going to cover in detail coming up here. Oh, question about EPS, extracellular polysaccharides. That's something I had mentioned in the micro analysis that we do. And that's just what helps hold your flock together. Bacteria make it naturally and it helps the uh, bacteria come together. You can run into issues if you have not enough or too much. It can also be an indicator of stress. Uh, questions about foam in a lagoon? Yeah, uh, I mean, one of those pictures earlier on was foam in a lagoon. Uh, agitation tends to be a big part of it. Uh, when you, say, install new aerators, uh, new, new bacteria growth, that's uh, probably outside the scope of this conversation, but we will... Uh, Talk about that offline if you'd like. Just shoot me an email. Question about Nicardia being present for an entire season. Oh yeah, it, pretty common to see that. All right, so next uh, I'm gonna pause on the questions there and we'll keep moving forward. So now we're into this section of the presentation where we talk about how filaments come to be in excessive amounts in a wastewater plant. And this scale here is the metaphor we'll come back to on a bunch of different slides here coming up. Um, but it's really about competitive balance. So all plants are going to have some filaments, like I mentioned. It's a good thing to have a little bit. And plants run into problem when they end up with excessive amounts of filaments. And the idea with this slide and the metaphor is that the good bacteria, what we're calling them here, uh, the good bacteria are your flock forming bacteria, your heterotrophic bacteria that do a great job um, settling and removing BOD and nutrients. Uh, so we're calling that your good bacteria. They're in constant competition with your filaments and the two kind of keep each other in check. And generally what you want is for your plant to be dominated by good heterotrophic flock forming bacteria. Now, sometimes the competition gets tilted and the filaments end up with a bit of an advantage and their numbers start growing. And so we're gonna look at what are the things that cause their numbers to grow in excess uh, in certain plants. And then we're gonna use that information towards the end to talk about how we prevent those conditions and how we get rid of filaments when we know those conditions are present. So the first thing is cold tolerance. Any operator who's run a wastewater plant through the types of climates we have in most of North America for a full year, knows that when you get to the wintertime temperatures, 
uh, your good bacteria become much less active. Their metabolic processes all slow down. So the filaments, on the other hand, are much more tolerant of cold weather. In fact, in some cases, they actually thrive in the cold water. So when your good bacteria slow down, they are they're replicating much more slowly, less metabolic activity. The filaments don't slow down as much, and their populations go up. One of the things that's notable about Nicardia, I mentioned earlier, was that it is really good at removing BOD from the water. And the reason for this is it has a massive amount of surface area. Conversely, the flock-forming bacteria have a lot less surface area. If you look at the bottom left of this slide, um, there's that image. And the bottom right of the image, you can see some, some good bacterial flock. And look at the amount of surface area that that flock of bacteria has relative to the Nicardia. So the Nicardia uses that surface area to be really effective at pulling nutrients out of the system, uh, carbon and you know the things that allow it to replicate. So uh, when you pass a certain point, you can reach a tipping point where the Nicardia starts beginning to get the vast bulk of the, the resources that are going into the plant. And that can weaken your, your good bacteria and that can become a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, so that's uh, surface area and efficient removal uh, is something that is an advantage to the filaments. And one of the things that tends to be a compounding factor when you have other things going on. Uh, up next, the flock forming bacteria. Uh, a lot of times we see cases where they are a little bit starved and then you have something else happen like cold weather and they really slow down. So the flock formers, when they're in a low FTEM situation, that just means that you have a lot of bacteria relative to the amount of food coming in. And in a low FTEM situation, they're a little bit starved. The filamentous bacteria are much less uh, affected by low FTEM conditions. And part of the reason for that is their surface area and ability to remove BOD. So when you're in low FTEM conditions and your uh, good bacteria are somewhat starved, they're gonna end up being the last to eat essentially while these filaments are using more of the resources. We see this happen a lot. Um, see, a lot of these slides are gonna go together here in terms of the causes, but when the fall comes, we see a lot of operators upping their mixed liquor concentration to get ready for cold temperatures. And then those cold temperatures come, so you, your bacteria slow down, you've upped your, your mixed liquor, which has um, started to kind of starve your good bacteria somewhat, that has also caused your sludge age to go up and you, know, you start adding factor after factor and it starts creating an environment that's more conducive to filamentous bacteria. And here's one that is, I would say almost every uh, microthrix or nicardia case that we come up against is gonna have this item in common. And that's gonna be high amounts of fats and oils coming in. The filamentous bacteria, nicardia, and microthrix, they love digesting fats and oils. It's probably their number one attribute. The flock forming bacteria are much more slow to digest grease. We're talking about aerobic wastewater systems here, and aerobic bacteria are quite a bit slower at digesting fats and oils. Uh, that's why systems that know they're gonna have super high amounts of fats and oils generated, like say food processing plants, they tend to have an anaerobic system on the front end to help knock down those fats and oils and then follow it with an aerobic system. And that's because your aerobic bacteria are pretty slow to digest grease. Nicardia and Microthrix, they love grease. Grease is actually a really energy rich food source. And so that is one of the things that really causes those two to take off is you get consistent high amounts of fats and oils coming in or slug loads of fats and oils, even just a single slug load can, can cause a population of foaming filaments to take off and then they're, they tend to stay with you once they have taken off. <clears throat> um, so that'll be something we talk about is addressing incoming fats and oils, but uh, for municipalities be thinking about, you know, grease trap maintenance and that kind of thing or food processing companies, uh, the 
is your lagoon removing the amount of fats and oils that it's really intended to, uh, especially some of the older ones that get filled with sludge or they've got massive grease caps can end up sending more fats and oils out the back end than, than they're really intended. So that's, that's a common one, key slide here, high fats and oils coming in. And so now we're gonna just take a quick look at the life cycle of a little bit of microthrix. So we start and we have some early stage small cells. Uh, they're probably present in a lot of plants, but not in major numbers. And what they love to do is consume fatty acids, fats and oils. Now let's say it's mid-November in Massachusetts and it's started to get a little bit colder out. And then all of a sudden we have a swing where it drops 10 degrees overnight and the flock forming bacteria really slow down. Filament populations start to grow relative to the flock formers and, uh, and increase. Filaments start protruding from the flock. Their numbers are continuing to grow. They provide or they uh, form interflock bridges and settling starts to get worse. Those bridges trap air, bring mixed liquor up to the surface. Because those fats and oils are a preferential food source for microthrix and nicardia, they're actually kind of naturally buoyant as well because they've digested so much fats and oils, it, it literally makes them buoyant. So they go up to the surface with some mixed liquor, they're agitated there, and we start to get foaming. Uh, your mixed liquor uh, ends up getting recycled and the this, this situation just kind of perpetuates itself. So how do we stop that cycle from happening? That's what we're moving into next is control strategies for preventing these filaments. Uh, the first one that a lot of folks are going to mention is chlorinating. Uh, it's, I'm gonna provide some commentary here that says that chlorinating is not the best thing you can do. And especially with Nicardia, it's not the best. Um, but a lot of folks are wanting to hear about this. So we're gonna cover it uh, as well. So chlorinating, the, the tough thing with it is you have to strike the absolute perfect balance. If you do a dose that is too low, a lot of times what you'll see is some short-term relief, but what the chlorine has actually done is fragmented the, in this case, let's say Nicardia, fragmented it so that it's not causing as much short-term foam. It's not catching as much air. It's not quite as stable and dense, but it's still there and it's not dead. Um, each one of those filament fragments is then going to grow into a new bundle of Nicardia. And what we see with uh, plants that have Nicardia that chlorinate is for a couple weeks, it seems to be going all right. And then um, you know, several weeks to a month later, the population of Nicardia is worse than it ever was. Uh, the other end, if you're not striking that fine line perfectly, is too high of a dose. And at that point, you will kill the filaments, no doubt. And the first thing you'll see to tell you that you've gone too far is a loss of the nitrifying bacteria, and that means higher ammonia on the effluent end. Um, essentially, what you're doing with chlorinating is introducing toxicity intentionally into your system, and you're hoping that you're going to add the absolute perfect amount and kill only the filaments. You know you're gonna kill some of your good bacteria, but you're hoping you have enough of it that it doesn't matter. Um, the amount of chlorine that it takes to kill your filaments, pretty similar to the amount that it takes to cause to kill your flock formers. And you're definitely gonna kill a bunch of nitrifiers. Um, so again, not to say that it can't be done and not to say that people haven't had success with this method, but it's really, uh, there are some downsides and it's pretty difficult to nail. Here's some uh, guidelines. Uh, these were put together by Steve Leash, I believe. Um, Leash Microbial. Uh, and so how to chlorinate correctly. Uh, it's gonna be a range. There's no one size fits all prescription, but anywhere from one to 10 pounds of chlorine per thousand pounds of mixed liquor, volatile solids, suspended inventory. And you'll wanna do that per day. Uh, ideally, you'll actually split that dose up and add it up to like three times per day. So it's a little more consistent and not one big slug. Start on the low end of the scale and add it to your return activated sludge. You'll wanna to monitor to make sure you're not going too high uh, as you're working your way up in the dose. And things to look at are uh, an increase in ammonia, tells you you're killing your nitrifiers. If you see a milky or cloudy effluent or higher TSS, 
that tells you you're killing your flock forming bacteria. Um, so those are good things to watch if you're trying to ratchet up your chlorine dose and hit it just right. You can also put it under the microscope and actually watch the, the cells die, lysine of the cells as they're being uh, oxidized by the chlorine. So that's how you would do that. Here's, uh, we're moving into some of the things that Aquafix does recommend on a consistent basis. And the first one is wasting. So I kind of went through that progression earlier where it's getting colder and you're up in your mixed liquor concentration to make sure you nitrify it well, and you get the filament outbreak. Well, that older sludge, because you decreased your wasting, is something you want to address right away when you see you've got a lot of filaments. And so that, that means increasing your wasting. It does a couple things. It lowers your sludge age, and it also does physically remove some of the filaments from your aeration basin. Uh, so you're lowering your sludge age, physically removing some of the filaments. Uh, plants that have outbreaks like this uh, down the road, they may end up with some foaming in their digesters because that's where the filaments tend to go as they get wasted out. Um, but usually that's something that's easier to handle. Another one is physical removal of the foam. So like I'd mentioned, filaments concentrate themselves up in the foam at the surface and physically removing the surface layer of foam with something like a back truck can be a really good strategy if you've done the other things that are needed to limit the growth of new filaments. I'd mentioned the plant that 30 days in was not really growing new Nicardia in their mixed liquor, but still had a fair amount at the surface. That would be an ideal candidate for having a back truck come in, remove what foam is at the surface, and that, that plant would be uh, just doing fantastic at that point. Uh, you can wait it out, and usually it's, say, another 30 days from then. Then I'm expecting that they'll have quite a bit less foam at the surface as well. But for fast uh, fast control, especially when combined with other items to help address the underlying cause and prevent new filament growth, uh, you get some real good decreases in foam amount when you remove that, that area. Think about where you're going to dispose of foam uh, that you do remove. Obviously, if you are just going to offload the vac truck at the head of the plant, you're going to recycle it all back in. So uh, you can do drying beds, you can also talk about uh, potentially chlorinating the foam that they've removed in the vac truck, and then you're not running the risk of hurting your good bacteria, letting that sit until the chlorine is no longer active, disposing the digester. Those would be potential options. Um, every plant will be able to handle that a little differently, and some may just not have access to a vac truck. Next, we'll talk about defoamers. That's something that people think about as a control strategy pretty quickly. Um, so some of the advantages of using a defoamer, they will knock the foam back pretty quickly in a lot of cases. And that's especially true for surfactant-based foams. Defoamers will knock those back really quick. The Nicardia that's been there a year, you might have to use quite a bit of defoamer to actually get that knock back. But generally, defoamers are pretty quick and pretty effective at knocking back the foam. Uh, usually, you're going to have to reapply it about every 18 to 24 hours. Word of note on defoamers, we caution strongly against using silicone-based defoamers because the silicone tends to interrupt the flock structure. So you can certainly cause more harm than good uh, when you're using a silicone-based defoamers. And a lot of the chemical companies, that's what they're going to have is a silicone-based defoamer. Um, I'll talk about Defoam 3000, which is what we have for a defoamer that's specifically formulated for biological systems. But always make sure that whatever defoam you use, it's for biological wastewater systems. The disadvantages of defoamers, uh, probably kind of apparent at this point, they don't get rid of the underlying cause. So if you just go on using the defoamer and never address what caused the filaments to show up, you're going to end up spending quite a bit of money on defoam, defoamer because you're never going to be able to stop using it. Uh, the, the relief you get from a defoamer is pretty temporary. Uh, so replying or reapplying pretty much daily, I would say, is typical. Sometimes you can get away with going a little bit longer in between. Uh, if your plant is having settling issues, the defoamer does not address that. But it can provide you some breathing room while you wait for those changes you're making to address the underlying issue uh, for those to work. And so there's definitely a place for defoamers. Ours is Defoam 3000. It's a blend of plant extracts, essential oils, uh, what it does is breaks the surface tension of the foam, prevents the foam from building up on itself, and basically pops the bubbles. You want to apply it, if possible, directly to the surface of the foam. 
and let it kind of permeate through the foam layer and that'll be the most efficient way to use it. If applying direct isn't possible, then you could always put it at the you know, front end of the plant and it'll have benefits that way as well. Here's a defoamer being used. I'm going back to surfactant based since that's one of the things that it's most effective on. And so this is an industrial plant that had some surfactants come in on the left, hit it with a little defoam 3000 uh, later in the day, looks like what you're seeing on the right. So they're quick, they're very effective. And then we're gonna start moving towards kind of like our, what we'd call our Aquafix prescription for uh, filament control. And that's to start working to starve out the filaments and boost the health of your flock forming bacteria. So that concept of them being in competition, we wanna tilt the balance in favor of your flock formers. And so the goal through what we're gonna be talking about next is starving the filaments out, boosting your flock formers. So grease control uh, is the thing that I had highlighted earlier as this is the one common denominator. So look at what you can do to minimize grease coming into your wastewater plant. So making sure that your grease trap program is enforced if you have one. Uh, what you're looking at in this image is a primary clarifier that its skimmer arm had been broken for some amount of time and you can see it's not removing grease. Uh, that plant was having some filament issues and I believe they cleared up pretty quickly after they got that filament arm working again. Uh, primary clarifiers are kind of, I, I don't know, falling out of favor is maybe the right word, but there's a lot fewer plants being built with them these days. Plants are relying more on you know, bar screens and other primary treatments that actually allow a lot of grease to slip through. So in a lot of these modern plants, uh, we're seeing more grease than ever actually making it to the, the aeration basin. So in terms of stopping foaming filament control, that's, that's not good. Um, but definitely make sure if you've got any ability to remove it upstream of aeration through grease traps and clarifiers and lift station maintenance that you're doing those things. Uh, for some industrial accounts, definitely making sure that your DAF units are working correctly and that you're adding the, the correct ratio of items if it's an enhanced DAF unit to make sure you're getting the absolute most out of it. And then you may look at some biological additives uh, upstream to help start breaking down some of the grease before it gets to the treatment plant. Um, so one of the things that we specialize in is uh, catalysts to help with grease control. One of our top ones is a product called QuickSymel, and it's a catalyst that breaks down grease. Uh, we would typically have you add this at the head of your wastewater plant. And what it's gonna do, it doesn't add any new bacteria. It actually just works with the bacteria that are already there to help them better break down and then better utilize the, the fats and oils, that energy rich food source, so that they can get some benefit out of it, not just the filaments. Here's a little diagram. Uh, it's gonna be animated here in a second that shows a fat molecule. So we've got a glycerol in the center. We've got three long chain fatty acids coming off of it. And then these little orange blobs are our quick SIML catalyst. And what the catalyst does is it will act on these structures to break the long chain fatty acids off. So to separate the fat molecule into long chain fatty acids. And because it's a blend of these catalysts, the next thing it's gonna do is another set is going to work on these long chain fatty acids. And it's gonna work on breaking specific bonds at the molecular level here and break this long chain into short chain fatty acids. And short chain fatty acids can be really beneficial for your plant. Um, they're more able to be utilized by your flock forming bacteria. And so this is gonna do two things. It's gonna help boost the health of your flock formers. They're gonna get more of that energy resource. And then it's also gonna start starving out the filament. Um, so when your filament has less fats and oils to digest because of your upstream things you've done, and then say some of your catalysts that's been used in the aeration basin to break down the backlog of fats and oils in the plant, that'll start to starve your filament out. One thing uh, I think I should point out about uh, plants that have had a lot of fats and oils coming in for years, by the time you address it in the upstream, you still have a lot of fats and oils that can literally just be entrained in your mixed liquor 
and in the actual aeration basin. So even while you're doing the upstream stuff, it can be really beneficial to add something like the quicksime to help work through and break down some of the fats and oils that are already you know, just a yeah, part of your system pretty much. Operators might sometimes note that they have like an oiliness to their mixed liquor, and that, that would be a telltale sign, but you wouldn't necessarily even need to feel or see that to, to know. Um, so that's uh, really an effective product. We love it, um, and operators do too. <clears throat> this is an independent study I'm highlighting here that was done on fat removal in wastewater systems, and it highlighted quicksime L and its ability to break down some common uh, cooking fats and food waste fats. So we start with a vegetable oil in this chart. This whole study is available on our website, and uh, actually we have it attached as a handout here. So in that control panel, feel free to uh, navigate to handouts and download this study. But it, it, what it's showing here is just the rate that the quicksime L accelerates the breakdown of vegetable oil as measured by uh, total fatty acids in this case. And a little bit heavier uh, FOGs like say bacon grease, very similar. So even the uh, you know fats and oils will break down, but what we really care about here is the gap between the, the control and the quicksime. And increasing the breakdown of those fats and oils at say uh, 28 hours here by 83%, that, that's a major difference. And over the course of say adding this for weeks or a month or so, that makes, it adds up to quite a lot. So we've covered the starving the filaments part. The next part we'll cover is boosting your flock formers. For that, we turn to a product called Foam Buster. And Foam Buster is a micronutrient blend. Uh, what it's gonna do is help boost the flock formers and it's got a uh, micronutrient in there that kind of helps program those good bacteria to digest fatty acids. So we use the quicksime L and the foam buster as kind of a one-two punch. Quicksime L to help break down uh, the grease into short fatty acids. And then we use the quicksime L to help break those fatty acids or digest those fatty acids by the flock formers. Um, so this is just boosting the health of your good bacteria. And as far as what you'd be looking at for dosing and length of time, uh, what we typically do is about 30 days of a, an initial dose and then another 30 days of a maintenance dose. And if you pair that with a little bit heavier wasting, it, it really can pro provide some phenomenal results. Uh, as far as dosage rates, let's just say a typical million gallon per day plant, you start out with the foam buster at about eight pounds per day, uh, then you switch to the four pound per day for the maintenance, add that directly to the aeration basin. The quicksime L for that million gallon per day plant, start out with about two and a half gallons per day, then move to, for the next 30 days, about 1.25 gallons, five quarts, add that at the head of the plant and break down the fats and oils. And that's what you'd be looking at. And most plants are gonna see major improvement uh, by 60 days and usually starting to see some nice benefits uh, between like 14 and 21 days. And there I've highlighted uh, the 100,000 gallon per day dose. <laughs> All right, um, show, it is just a little graphic showing how the two work together. You add the biocatalyst and it takes the fats and oils, breaks them down to fatty acids, the micronutrient, growing your flock formers, helping them digest fatty acids, and what you hit there is a zone where you start starving the filaments. <clears throat> I also will mention uh, some of the upstream grease control stuff. Uh, we had talked about grease trap maintenance and that kind of thing, especially for municipalities uh, in your collection systems. You want to make sure that whatever you're doing in the collection line isn't actually pushing more grease down to the plant while you're having a filament issue. So there are kind of like three distinct types of lift station grease control. There are heat-based products that melt the grease and that will definitely worsen a foaming filament outbreak or can even cause one entirely just from like a couple of uses. Uh, there are solvent-based products that liquefy the grease, uh, effectively doing the same thing as the heat-based where you're pushing it downstream. Uh, 
The third option is biological treatments. And again, that's where we specialize. So the biological treatments are adding bacteria. And in a lot of cases, it's just bacteria by themselves aren't even enough. It's about getting the right nutrients and probiotics in there to make sure the bacteria are active and that they're programmed uh, biologically to, to digest fats and oils. So we have a great block uh, called Bug on a Rope. It's a blend of bacteria plus a nutrient and oxygen rich uh, base or outer shell is what we're calling it um, right now. And it, it slowly dissolves as the incoming flow goes over it. It releases those key nutrients and bacteria that are actually going to be active in your collection system. And it, it just begins the process of breaking down those fats and oils ahead of the actual wastewater plant. So by the time that flow gets to your aeration basin, you are not going to be entirely stuck with all full three-chained fatty acid glycerol bound uh, fat molecules. Instead, you will have started the process of breaking some of this down to long chain fatty acids. Um, it can be a great complement to a current treatment if you're having an issue. Um, but one of the things this is great for is preventing future issues. Get that breakdown of fats and oils started off early and have fewer issues in the future. Here's going to be an example of a before and after. This is a wastewater system that had a lot of nicardia in it, and they did the foam buster and quicksime. And these are uh, within about 90 days of each other, I believe. And you can see all that scum that was generated by filaments and aeration. A lot of times if you're seeing scum in the clarifiers, uh, it's related to filaments, even if you don't have major foam there, and especially like the center well might be a common spot. But so this is a, a, a big success story for foam, bu foam buster and quicksime, and it's kind of a dramatic one, but in in almost all cases, we, we get really good results and we always get some, some positives. So it's uh, one case study there. Here's a case study that kind of circles us right back to the beginning about the importance of knowing exactly what you're dealing with. Um, not every foam is going to be filament based. And even though you say, look at the one on the left, you say, well, that's not a surfactant, so it must be uh, microthrix or nicardia. In this case, it was a foam that was caused by a filament related to a nitrogen deficiency. So there are other filaments that can cause foam, those foams tend not to look exactly like a filament foam, but just because you're not seeing uh, a white fluffy foam, not always good to assume that you've got microthrix or nicardia. So we do always recommend, we love coming back to the microanalysis to get started out uh, with any treatment. And so this is one where uh, we actually addressed a nitrogen deficiency, and that's what actually caused this turnaround. So definitely uh, keep that in mind consider us for the microanalysis as well. Some key takeaways here uh, as we're getting towards the end of this one. Filaments will always be present in small numbers. Generally, that's not a problem. Uh, when those filaments numbers increase beyond a certain point, they start trapping foam, rising to the surface with mixed liquor and causing uh, foam. Defoamers can work, they de deflate the foam, but what we really wanna focus on is addressing the underlying issue. Uh, we recommend keeping a lower sludge age for plants that are prone to uh, foaming filament issues, uh, whatever is required to achieve uh, your nitrogen removal. Um, and you want to kind of toe that line, basically. Uh, get good at controlling or better digesting incoming grease to prevent future issues and even to address current ones. And then out-competing the filament, it's, all, it's a competition for resources. Take some of the things that you've learned here about what makes the filaments uh, more prevalent, start looking at how that applies to your system and figure out ways you can address each one of those individually to make it a less conducive environment to filaments. Uh, as I'd mentioned, there's some materials provided. You should be able to download them out of the handouts section in your control panel. There's that research paper that I had some images of earlier on Quicksime. I've also got for you the dosing sheets for Quicksime and Foam Buster. And here on the screen um, is going to be a link to our microorganism database. Anyone who is doing some, some like microscopic analysis on your own, that database on our website, really fantastic. It uh, will help you figure out exactly what you're looking at. 2021 webinar series, and I'm, I'm going to get to questions in just a second. Um, so we are starting to wrap up, but there will be uh, plenty of time for Q&A. 
But first, I want to tell you about the 2020 webinar series. We've got the dates all set. We've got the topics set. We've got the presenters set. We're really excited about what we have coming up in 2021. Um, so take a look there. We'll do nitrification. We'll talk about anaerobic digester stability. Plants with redworms and midge flies, you wouldn't believe how easy they are to get rid of. We can talk about how to do that. Um, the pursuit of better grease control is going to be a new topic, and everyone highlight that one. It, it should be really good. Uh, we'll talk about algae blooms, especially harmful algae for lagoon operators and what causes it. Uh, another one to highlight, August 25th, the truth about bacterial and enzyme supplements. You'll want to catch that one. It's a new topic for this year, and it's going to be good. Uh, always popular, the microscopic basics will be uh, in September, and then we'll, we love talking about foaming filaments with you as well. You can always see the past webinars by going to our website, and that's that. Um, so now we will go back to questions. Would an orthophosphate deficiency cause filaments to grow? Uh, yeah, absolutely it could. You would get a specific type of filament based on that deficiency. I wouldn't expect microthrix uh, to be one that would <clears throat> be related to that, but pretty, I mean, it's, yeah, definitely start by knowing which filaments you have. And if you're aware of a deficiency, that's something where working directly with one of our microbiologists and chemists would, would definitely be a good way to go. Um, so question here, we have a dark foam that looks like sludge and greasy bubbles in it. Um, micro exam shows no filaments. Uh, for that one, I would actually think back to one of the early slides here. I had mentioned a dense foam that could be the result just of a slug load of grease. And it sounds to me like that might be what's going on. Uh, probably, especially knowing, knowing that you have greasy bubbles, uh, that grease, when you get that backlog of grease I had mentioned entrained in your mixed liquor, um, that grease is buoyant as well and can bring some mixed liquor up to the surface. I would say that's why it looks like sludge is probably because it is. And once uh, you get mixed liquor at the surface, that's when you start having foam. I would hit that with uh, a heavy dose of quicksime L for like 30 days and I would expect to see some pretty big improvement. I would also take a close look at what you have coming into the plant for FOGs, fats and oils. You can do that. Uh, a lot of commercial labs will have an actual FOG test, and uh, I believe you are municipal, if I recall. And so anything above like 30 parts per million, every plant's going to respond differently. But anything above 30 to 35 parts per million influent FOG, I would say, is where you start seeing cause for concern. So I'd take a look at what's going on upstream, maybe even measure it uh, with a local commercial lab. <clears throat> We've got a person, an attendee here who says, we have a tan colored foam. We recently upgraded our blowers. Settling test results got a bit worse. Our settling went from 460 to 700. Could it be due to the blower? Our settling is improving. I, I would be curious to see a microscopic exam. Uh, you could be growing new bacteria and have a relatively young sludge. I wouldn't expect a relatively young sludge to be bulked up to that level. So you may have other filaments that are causing the bulking. Um, it sounds like if it's going in the right direction that hopefully this will just be a short term issue for you. Um, this is one where on the microanalysis, I would be definitely curious about the filaments because you have major bulking going on. But uh, looking at flock structure is the other big thing here. Is there evidence of you know flock that is too small, like it's getting sheared potentially? Uh, those would be some of the things I'd be thinking about on that one. I'd be hesitant to recommend any specific treatment uh, without knowing any more details on that one. Uh, what concentration of defomer is effective is a question here. It does not take much. A uh, plant with uh, 100 to say 250,000 gallons of flow per day, you probably get away with about a pint per day um, added to the aeration basin. Uh, that, that one does not take a lot. You do need to add it daily. Um, but so yeah, it's you, you'll be probably pretty happy with the amount that's required because it is ultra concentrate and it knocks it back really, really well. Um, 
Oh, this is one that's probably a common or popular topic is certificates. Yes, we will have some certificates available for anyone who attended live. Just hit reply to the email that you get thanking you for attendance and the certificates are by request. You need to request it to get one, but we will be happy to make up a certificate of attendance. You can submit it to your state agency and ask them for CEUs. Generally, uh, let them know beforehand you'll be attending might help your cause in terms of getting CEUs. We don't have them by default approved in any state at this point. <clears throat> Uh, best parameter to measure as far as incoming grace, uh, I think I already hit that one, FOG test, uh, local commercial lab can do it for you. Uh, well, yes, will the presentation be made, made available? I will send, or well, we'll automate it, send a link to everyone who attended, letting you uh, access a recording. That link will be coming seven days from now. Do you need volatile fatty acids for phosphorus removal? A bit outside the scope of this presentation, but yes, they help immensely. Breaking down the grease into short chain fatty acids, if you have an, an anoxic zone designed for phosphorus removal, can definitely help improve that phosphorus removal. Uh, question about the relationship between redworms and foaming. Uh, we have definitely seen times where there are foaming conditions that go away when the redworms are treated. If you have an especially high concentration, they can kind of alter the properties of the sludge. You uh, might see like a stringiness in your return activated sludge. Um, I'm not entirely clear on the mechanism how that causes foaming, but yeah, we do have quite a few examples of plants with major redworm outbreaks who treated with our Aquabac. Uh, look that up on our website, Aquabac XT and Bug Juice, and the foaming went away. A uh, question about the frequency of if you're going to have a vac truck out to suck off foam, uh, if you do it multiple times per week, will that by itself fix the problem? That would, it will cause significant improvements in in terms of lessening the amount of foam. That by itself is not going to stop you from growing new filaments. So I would say pair that with some other control strategies and that's a winner for sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, question about what class was it for more in-depth info on the microscopic exam? That's our microscopic basics. Go to the Team Aquafix website and go to webinars and education and go to the archives at part of the drop-down med menu. It'll be in the upper bar there. Uh, it was the one we did last month, so it'll be the most recent. Question uh, from Chris here, if we use Quicksime L and increase the wasting, um, you will be increasing your food load. Well, you will be making more food accessible to the bacteria when you increase your wasting. Uh, I would expect a lot of plants to not be so close to overloaded that that increase in food from adding the quick L is going to put them over the edge. Usually when I'm ranking the priorities, getting the sludge age down uh, tends to be higher on the priorities list. Um, and I'm generally not too concerned about overwhelming the, the plant. But if you are monitoring your sludge age really well, like I happen to know Chris and some of the folks he works with do, um, that, that's not a one size fits all recommendation on the wasting. So if you are paying close uh, attention to your sludge age and your uh, MCRT, uh, I won't say that increasing your wasting is a blanket recommendation for those types of cases, especially if your plant may be close to overloaded. Does microthrix cause high volatiles in the mixed liquor suspended solid? I mean, it certainly adds more volatile mass um, and causes bulking. Uh, it kind of depends on what you mean by does it cause high? What, what do you mean by high volatiles? And it uh, adds volatile mass to your mixed liquor calculation, yes. Um, does microthrix cause sludge bulking in the clarifier? Uh, yeah, in a lot of cases it can. Um, Picturing that stack of filaments all tangled together, they don't collapse very well. The analogy I heard for that is uh, think about if you had a bunch of straw, like hay, hay straw, and you were putting that in a five gallon bucket, and then think about if you had a similar volume of marbles, 
the marbles representing flock in this case and the straw representing filaments, those uh, the straw just doesn't settle as well. It's not going to be as neatly packed in there. So you get a lot, bunch of microthrix in your mixed liquor, absolutely yes, you will uh, see a decrease in settling or bulking in the clarifier. When you email for a certificate, if you would like a copy of the presentation, uh, yeah, feel free to request the slides. We can get those to you. Oh, okay, uh, this is a rephrasing of a question I answered a minute ago, is how would, I'm gonna read it directly. Uh, how does adding quickzyme affect the phosphorus removal when you need VFAs for BioP? Yeah, so those VFAs are an important part of the biologic phosphorus removal. And in a lot of cases, people are adding additional VFAs to help enhance that process. A lot of times fats and oils may slip through that process without being fully digested. So when you add the quicksime L, you are breaking that grease. Again, when it's in the grease molecule, it's not a volatile fatty acid, it's unaccessible by your phosphorus accumulating microorganisms. You gotta get it broken down into the VFAs for those microorganisms to access it. So I would say that it will increase the amount of available VFAs you have for BioP. A question about filaments in your mixed liquor. I think this is a municipal plant and the effect that that may have on anaerobic digesters. And Taylor, let me know if, uh, separately if this isn't addressing the question because I, I want to make sure I uh, address it. But the big issue you can see when you have a lot of filaments that cause foam in your mixed liquor is that when they show up in your digester, anaerobic digester, they cause foam there. They don't tend to grow in the anaerobic digester, but they're pretty resistant to breaking down. And so those filaments will stabilize naturally occurring foam from the anaerobic digester for a period of about 30 to 60 days. We've got some slides that I've shown in years past that show uh, a microscopic slide of an anaerobic digester sample taken from a municipal treatment plant that had a, quite a bit of microthrix in it and that digester was foaming and we knew that the the samples had been in or that what we were looking at in the samples had been there about 30 days in the anaerobic digester and they weren't growing they were somewhat broken down but they still had their structural integrity and so what they were doing is stabilizing the foam that was occurring in the digester all right uh looks like that covers a lot of the questions i appreciate uh a lot of you stuck it out through the whole q a session so i hope you found it useful i hope you found the presentation useful check us out in 2021 with some of those new webinars and we'll look forward to seeing you all there please tell a friend as well thank you